doctrine. It's the opposite of Ephesus. It embraces everyone. Then in verse 18 we have the church at Thyatira, which is the pagan church, the church that is full of cultic practices. Chapter 3 begins with the church of Sardis, which is representative of dead churches. It has a reputation for being alive, but in reality it is dead. The next church mentioned is the church of Philadelphia. It's the church that we would all like to be a member of because it is the alive church for which Jesus has no criticism whatsoever. And then finally, in verse 14 of chapter 3, we have the church at Laodicea. In many respects, it is the most pathetic of all the churches because it's the worldly and apathetic church. The church that is neither hot nor cold because it could just simply care less. Now, as I said, these seven churches are representative of every kind of church that exists today. You will find your church in one of these seven or a combination of them. I think they are also representative of seven different types of Christians. So I ask you, are you a legalistic Christian? A persecuted Christian? Liberal? Worldly? Are you dead? Are you alive? Are you apathetic? I believe these seven churches are also representative of seven periods of church history. All seven types of churches have always existed. All of them exist today. But one type has dominated each period of church history. The church at Ephesus is representative of the apostolic period from 30 A.D. to 95 A.D. when the church was concerned about organization and doctrine to the point that it became legalistic. The church at Smyrna represents the persecuted church or the martyr church that existed from 95 A.D. to 312 A.D. It's the church that existed at the time that the book of Revelation was written. Then we have the liberal church of Pergamum representing the apostate church that existed from 312 to 590. This period uh, developed after the Emperor Constantine was converted and the church and the state were welded together. As is always the case in such unions, the state began to corrupt the church. The church of Thyatira represents the dark pagan period from 590 to 1517 when the papacy developed and the church became full of Babylonian occultic practices. When we come to the Reformation, in 1517, we think of it as a time of life, but it was only partially so. The Reformation produced the Protestant state churches of Europe, churches that had a reputation for being alive, but were really dead because of their union with the state. So, the Church of Sardis, the dead church, with the reputation for being alive, represents the post-Reformation period from 1517 to about 1750. The opposite of Sardis is the church at Philadelphia, the alive church. It represents the period of church history from about 1750 when the church began to send missionaries out all over the world until about 1925 when the German school of higher criticism invaded seminaries worldwide and destroyed many people's faith in the Word of God. The church of today is represented by the church of Laodicea, a church that says to the world, I am rich and have become wealthy and need nothing whatsoever. But Jesus says to that church, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It is a worldly, apathetic, apostate church that will not even let Jesus in the front door. You know, the best summary of these letters that I have ever encountered is the one penned by John Stott in his book, Basic Christianity. He sees the message of Jesus as threefold in nature. To a sinful church, Jesus is saying, I know your sin, repent. To a doubtful church, Jesus is saying, I know of your doubt, believe. And to a fearful church, He is saying, I know of your fear, endure. Repent, believe, endure. That's a very relevant message for the church today. One final thing about these letters. Please note that each of these seven letters end with promises to overcomers. I would exhort you to go through and make a list of them and study them very carefully. You'll find a total of 13 promises. The program that you're viewing today is included in this two-DVD album called The Seven Churches of Revelation and presents a fascinating overview of the seven letters which Jesus dictated to seven churches located in what we now call the nation of Turkey. In this video, Dr. Reagan will show you the Isle of Patmos where Jesus appeared to the Apostle John and share photos and videos from archaeological excavations in the cities of the seven churches. You'll be blessed as Dr. Reagan explains how the letters apply to the church and your life today. The album contains a teacher's manual, student study guides, and a slideshow of photographs of the island of Patmos and the seven churches of Revelation. This album is available for a gift of $25 or more.
Welcome back to our study of the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation. I am delighted to have in the studio with me two of my colleagues who are experts on Bible prophecy. One is Don McGee, the founder and director of Crown and Sickle Ministries located in Amite, Louisiana. That's right outside of Baton Rouge. The other is my former associate and uh, evangelist, Dennis Pollock, who now is serving his own ministry called Spirit of Grace, located in McKinney, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. Well, Phyllis, I uh, want to thank you right up front for taking the time out from your busy schedules to come here and be with me today. And I want you to warn you right up front, I'm going to give both of you all the tough questions uh, that we have on this program, okay? Thank you. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> okay. Well, we're not going to have time to talk about all 13 of the promises that are given in these letters to the seven churches of Revelation. But uh, I do want to try to cover as many as possible. And I thought we might just get into this by giving you a chance to tell me which one of these 13 is your favorite. And whoever goes first, you better jump in fast because the other one will probably take your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Don. I'll be the gentleman here. Uh, each one of them has a, a real distinct appeal to me. A, a couple of them that come to mind as I read this is uh, we'll be allowed to eat of the tree of life. I, I like to eat, and, and I believe with, with this we're going to be able to consume all of this tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life we want. It's not going to have any cholesterol. And it's going to have a different in. fruit every month. That's right, and, and it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be healthy for you. I, I, I look forward to that. Uh, also, the idea of uh, never being separated from God again, that has to do with wow. chapter 2, verse 11, where we will not be hurt That's by awesome. the second death. We'll talk perhaps later about mm -hmm. the first death. Uh, just to be able to be with God for all eternity. And then the authority over the nations. Now, look, uh, you can't go down and <laughs> I, I just We wanted your favorite, Don. You're well, going to select every one of us. We won't have anything left. I have three favorites. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one is the authority over the nations. I really look forward to participating in a righteous rule over the nations. Okay. Now, uh, Dennis, uh, what, what is your favorite? And by the time you get through, there probably won't be anything left well, for me I, to choose. Well, I picked 12 of the 13. <laughs> No, no, I was a good boy. Actually, I just, I just chose one, and it's actually the very last one. It's uh, from the 21st verse in chapter 3. He, Jesus says, He who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne. Oh, boy. As I yeah, overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. And it speaks to me of two things. W one, it speaks of intimacy. I mean, you can't get much closer to someone than sitting right next to them. And I, I don't know how big the throne of Jesus is, but I think I'll be right up alongside of Him. And then the idea, of course, is, is the idea of co-reigning with Christ, which the Bible makes clear is what we will do throughout eternity. And as I was meditating on that, I thought about when I was like 14 years old, I wanted to drive so desperately. And I finally convinced my dad <laughs> to let me steer. Now, he wouldn't let me actually drive. <laughs> and he'd still be in the driver's seat, but he'd let me kind of steer. And then every once in a while, if I'd make, mess up too badly, he'd put his hand on the wheel and he'd fix it for me. And I, it kind of reminded me of what we'll be doing with Jesus. Hey, we'll be yeah. co-driving with him, the universe reigning with him, and that's an awesome thing. Well, I tell you, that's one of my favorites, too. And I, let me just ask you this question. What do you say to the vast majority of Christendom who says we're already doing that, <laughs> that we're reigning with Jesus right now, sitting on his throne with him? Well, it, it, if we're reigning with Christ, the world is not doing very well as a result of we're that. We're not doing a very good we're job. We're not doing a good job. And, and uh, no, I mean, that, that's one of those things that if you look and you think about it very long, you say, no, it just can't be. And furthermore, the Bible says Jesus is going to reign on the throne of David. And where is the right. throne of David? Is it in heaven? It's always been in one place. In Jerusalem. In and Jerusalem. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, neither one of you touched on the one that I was all going right. to mention. Go for uh, it, I, I, Again, <laughs> all of them are my favorite. I love them all. But uh, there's a sentimental favorite. And I don't know why. It's just that when I first time mm. I ever read it, it just touched my heart. And that is in uh, chapter 2, verse 17, where it says that uh, those who are overcomers are going to be given a white stone. Mm. And a new name will be written on that stone, which nobody knows but he who receives it. And, and I just... I don't know why. That, that just touched my heart. A white stone. Back in that day and time when you were tried by a jury and, and uh, it was time for the jury to make their verdict, you'd walk over, put your hand out, and they'd put in your hand either a white stone or a black stone. Black if you were guilty and white if you were innocent. And the Lord's going to put in my hand a white stone that's going to say, David, you're innocent. And hey, I, I know I'm not innocent, uh, but I'm innocent by the blood of Jesus Christ 
because I stand in His righteousness and not my own. And, and God's going to forgive me and forget all those sins that I've committed, and I will stand righteous before Him. That touches my heart. And on that stone is going to be a new name. You know, God loves to change names. Yep. All through the Bible, he changed, he changed Abraham's name. He changed Sarah's name. He changed Paul's name. He changed Peter's name. He loves to change names at new points in our spiritual development. Well, boy, this is going to be a new point. Well, you know, I'm glad of that because the truth is I've never liked my name anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and one word, Mom, why do you name me Rocky or somebody a little more mass Dennis, you know? Well, but anyway. I have a suspicion. Now, this is just a suspicion that the new name we're going to get in eternity is going to be related to our spiritual walk in this life. And I, I would imagine some might get the name of perseverance or faith or hope or charity. Uh, wouldn't it be awful to look at it and say, well, your name for eternity is going to be wishy-washy. <laughs> I hope that's not the situation with me, but I'm looking forward to that. Okay, those are our favorites. Now let's look at some of these other uh, promises that are made here. You know there's a total of 13 of them. And one of them says we will not be hurt by the second death. Now what in the world is that? The world, I, I, I find that non-Christians have great difficulty with that idea when you start talking about, I'm not subject to the second death. And what, what, what about the first death? What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, Jesus made it real plain uh, when he uh, describes it. I think it's in Revelation 20 where he talks about the, uh, the wicked will be cast into the lake of fire. And then he, the words are added, which is the second death. Okay. So the second death is that consuming lake of fire that uh, the wicked will go into. Yeah. Well, it's not just a, a lake of fire. Yeah, that's very real and it's going to be very painful. But the second death has to do with the idea of separation. Oh, yeah. if, if you're separated from someone, that adds to the torment. A, a person can be in pain, a person can be in suffering, but as long as they are in close proximity to someone that they love, there is always comfort and, and, and a sense of a close association. When a person is separated from God for all eternity, that's the premier thing about death. Yeah. I, had a fellow, I had a fellow say to me one day, Tammy said, have you ever thought about if you're born again, you die only once, but if you're not born again, you die twice. Mm -hmm. And the world doesn't understand that. Yeah. It's something needs to be said, I believe, about the first death. And it's, it's from Ephesians 2, 1, where it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That's the first death. We're separated from God by our sin. But it doesn't mean that our sin is going to keep us separated from Him for all eternity. As Christians, we have yeah. that rest, restored fellowship. Right. But if a person is not a Christian, not only are they dead in their trespasses and sin, separated from God in this life right now, mm -hmm. but for all eternity they'll be separated from You know, from the him. Bible says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. And basically the sinner spends his life praying to God to leave him alone. He avoids church. He avoids uh, solid preaching. He, he, he doesn't like strong Christians to talk about God. Basically, their whole life is a prayer saying, Oh, God, would you just please leave me alone? And God, who answers prayer, says, Fine. We'll do it. I'll do it for eternity. Wow. Well, let's take a look at one of the most enigmatic of all these promises. Some of you these better tell us what enigmatic means. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these promises are not very clear. There's one that's kind of like a Chinese puzzle. And that is in chapter 2, verse 17, the verse I just ran from, uh, ran from, that I just read from. Read from. And it says there that uh, the overcomer will be given some of the hidden manna. What in the world is that talking about? <laughs> well, the word manna, you remember from the, from the Old Testament, means what is it? And I think mm -hmm. that when we are in the presence of the Lord, the things that we're going to given, be given will be an understanding of what it is. <laughs> I think that we will, we're going to know some things that we're totally incapable of knowing now. And I think that's going to be a sort of feeding for the soul. There will be a spiritual feeding for the soul there uh, because our knowledge will increase. We will, the, 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 enigma, uh, the, the things about God that we do not and cannot understand now will be revealed to us at that time. You know, I think that uh, eternity is going to be a, a constant process of learning. Uh, we'll be learning more and more about God throughout all eternity. And I think that uh, since God is infinite, no matter how much we learn, there will just be that much more to learn. The Same with deep. His Word. I think we can study His Word for all eternity. And it wouldn't it be great to sit down with the Apostle uh, John, for example, he said, well, let's go through the Gospel of John. And he'd just show you so many things that you never even thought of before. It'd just be exciting. You know, you, know, you pick up on a good point. A, a lot of people assume that the minute you die and go to heaven, <laughs> you know everything about everything. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we will never be God. Uh, we're not God now. We won't turn into God when we go to heaven. We won't know everything then. And you're right. We will be learning continually. And, and the neat thing of it is uh, we'll enjoy it. <laughs> Some people don't yes, like it. I, I think we're going to be growing eternally. Yeah. Growing eternally. Well, here's another one that's almost equally enigmatic. And that is chapter 2, verse 28. 
says to the overcomer, I'm going to give him the morning star. What in the world is the morning star? Well, Jesus actually tells us he is the morning star. It's, it's actually in the same book uh, where he says, I'm the bright and the morning star. And uh, so... In chapter 22, verse 16, yeah, I believe last, it is. Yeah. last chapter of, yeah. of Revelation. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And it's kind of neat because oftentimes he talks about doing something for us or giving something to us. And then we find that what he does for us or what he gives to us <clears> is himself. Like he talks about leading uh, the believers to living fountains of waters. Well, he is the living fountain of waters. And then he talks about giving us the morning star. Well, he is the morning star. So he's not only the door and the giver, he's the gift and, and what we receive. <laughs> I mean, he is all in all. That's right. Well, what about chapter 3, verse 12? Another one that's uh, a little bit difficult to understand. In chapter 3, verse 12, he says, um, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. What, what does it mean to be a pillar in the temple of God? We talk about people being pillars of the community. There you go. And, you know, we, we use that uh, quite often in, in regular speech. It simply means that you are a, have a place of prominence uh, and responsibility and authority uh, within a community. Uh, and there's, there's a time coming when Christians are going to share in that authority that God is going to give them. Uh, through Jesus, His Son. We are not just, uh, we are like Him in that we're going to be co-heirs with Him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that means that what He has, we have. There is probably no portion of the Bible that has been more ignored or abused by the church than Bible prophecy. It has been trashed by liberals. It has been spiritualized into meaninglessness by those who do not believe that it means what it says. And it has been trivialized by fanatics who have used it as a playground for sensational speculations. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy. A program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. This is the first in a series of programs on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy. We're going to begin with a discussion of the abuse of prophecy. In the second program, we'll take a look at the importance of prophecy. During our third program, we'll discuss the fascinating variety of prophecy. The fourth program will focus on the interpretation of prophecy, and we will see that the best way to understand it is to look for its plain sense meaning. In our fifth program, we'll take a look at the various end time viewpoints, or to put it another way, we'll take a look at the four major ways in which people have interpreted end time prophecy. The sixth and final program in the series will be devoted to a presentation of an overview of the signs of the times that point to the soon return of Jesus. And now, let's begin this series of programs with a look at the abuse of Bible prophecy. My topic is the abuse of Bible prophecy. Folks, let's face it, Bible prophecy is held in contempt by most people. Non-Christians just scoff at the very idea that anything supernatural could be going on in this world, that anyone would have supernatural knowledge. But the tragedy is that many professing Christians share this particular attitude, this scoffing attitude. And the con consequence of this is a paradox. The paradox is that we worship a God of prophecy. And yet we ignore the prophetic word. There's a great passage about this in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, that I'd like to bring your attention to. In this passage, God, speaking through Isaiah, says, I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. Now, God is saying here, I am the one and only unique God. And I can prove this because I know what's going to happen in the future. I am omniscient. And I can prove it because I have the power, I'm omnipotent, to see to it that what I say will come to pass. 
And because of this, we are exhorted throughout the Scriptures to pay attention to Bible prophecy. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, Paul admonishes us with the words, Do not despise prophetic utterances. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter wrote these words. He said, We have the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp that is shining in a dark place. And yet, despite these warnings, there is a long and sad Christian heritage regarding Bible prophecy. Throughout most of Christian history for the past 2,000 years, Bible prophecy has been abused and Bible prophecy has been ignored. In fact, the only portion of God's Word that has been as abused and ignored as Bible prophecy is the very beginning of the Bible, the creation story. In fact, I don't know if you ever stopped to think about this. The two areas of the Bible most abused and most ignored throughout history have been the beginning of the Bible and what the Bible says about the end times. Those two areas Satan has concentrated on in trying to convince people that they are not true, that they are to be skeptical of them, that they do not mean what they say. Let's take a look for a moment at people today who are causing the problems with regard to Bible prophecy. There are three groups that I want to talk about. In fact, before I do that, let me just make a point. And that point is that the very scoffing that we've been talking about, the very attitude of scoffing, is in itself a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and an indication that we are living in the end times. Look here at 2 Peter chapter 3. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And we have people like that all over the place today. You know, where is He coming? Why hasn't He come? He never will come. He's delayed so long. It's all a fable. It's all a myth. Even professing Christians saying these sort of things. Well, of the groups that are abusing Bible prophecy, the first group that I would mention are what I call the apostates. The apostates are people who are professing Christians, but who scoff at the Word of God, not only regarding Bible prophecy, but just about everything in the Word of God. And yet they profess to be Christians. These are people who do not accept the Bible as the revealed Word of God. Instead, what they argue is that the Bible is man's search for God, and therefore it is full of myth and legend and superstition. They argue that there is no such thing as Bible prophecy. They argue that every prophecy in the Bible was really written after the effect and manipulated to make it appear to be prophetic in nature. They hate, for example, the book of Daniel, despise it completely because it is so accurate in its prophecies. And yet our Lord Jesus Christ quoted the book of Daniel. I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about when I talk about scoffing. This is a non-denominational ministry. As a non because of that, I have been to just about every kind of church you can possibly imagine. I have been to Orthodox and Unorthodox, Charismatic, Non-Charismatic, Pentecostal. I've been to churches that you couldn't even imagine. But I've been to all kinds. And I've discovered the Lord has a great sense of humor in getting me into some of these churches that uh, once I got there, they wished I'd never come. I'll give you an example. Back in the early 80s, when I was on radio, I had a call from a man one day who said, I've been listening to your radio program. And he said, you know what? I would love for you to come to our church in the Mid-Cities area between Dallas and Fort Worth. He was from a mainline Protestant denomination. He said, I'd love for you to come to our church and, and teach one Sunday evening. I said, well, I'd be glad to come. Just have your pastor invite me. He said, that's the problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, our pastor does not like Bible study. He said, on Sunday evening, we have entertainment. He said, he brings in folk singers and dancers and ballet. And, and uh, uh, he said, he, we've had puppeteers. We, everything you can think of except Bible study. He said, he just doesn't like it. So he said, it's going to be very difficult for me to get him to invite you. And I said, well, I don't know what to do about that. He said, well, I tell you what, give me a jazzy title. And you know what? The moment he said that, I thought it was funny, but the moment he said it, just like that, a title popped into my mind. This was in the early 80s. Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, was still popular. And the title that popped into my mind was The Future of the Late Great Planet Earth. He said, wow, that's jazzy. He said, pray for me. It's going to take a miracle. The next day, this guy called me, and you could have heard him shouting all the way across Dallas. He was so excited. He said, brother... You're invited. You're invited. The pastor will be sending you a letter. He said, I can't believe it. I didn't even have to argue.
get with him. Now, what he did not know and what I did not know, uh, only God knew, was that when he walked into that pastor's office, now this is hard to believe, but this is the way that God, God orchestrated. When he walked into that pastor's office, he said, I have a man that would like to invite to teach Bible prophecy. And he said, uh, Bible prophecy? He said, yes. He said, what's his title? He said, the future of late great planet Earth. He said, invite him. Because that man was sitting there at that moment reading a book by that title, a book I'd never heard of, a book by a man who was debunking Bible prophecy, saying there is no such thing, there's not one prophecy in the Bible, and Hal Lindsey is an idiot. Well, folks, (laughs) I was invited. And when I got there that night, he stands up and he says, we're so glad to have this learned man on Bible prophecy. He's going to tell us tonight why there is no such thing in the Bible. And I'm looking around. Is he introducing me? And I jump up. Well, you know, there's 200 people there. I run up and I tap him on the shoulder and I say, I need to talk to you for a minute. And in front of the whole congregation, I call him over and I said, you know, I think there's been a mistake. He said, why? I said, I believe in Bible prophecy. He said, there's been a mistake. I said, do you want me to go home? He said, no, just keep it short. I said, okay. So I got up. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. You know, I said, okay, I tell you what, let's do. Uh, let's turn to the book of Acts. Everybody turn to the book of Acts. And I was going to show them how the very first gospel sermon ever preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost was nothing but Bible prophecy from end to end. He said, this prophecy this prophecy, this prophecy, this prophecy, and Jesus fulfilled them all. And the people said, what must we do to be saved? So I said, turn to Acts chapter 2. And I didn't hear any pages rustling. You know, that's music to the, the ears of a preacher. I looked out there by sitting there like this. I said, how many have a Bible? No one had one. I said, okay, uh, get the pew Bibles. The guy stood up and said, we don't have pew Bibles in this church. I said, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll lead you in three songs. And while we do that, you send the deacons through the educational wing of the building, get all the Bibles and bring them back in here. We led three songs. They came back and said, we can't find any Bibles in this church. The pastor stood up and said, well, I think I got a few in my office. He comes out, he's got five Bibles. We divide the congregation of five groups. He gave each group a Bible. I said, okay, now, great. Turn to Acts chapter 2. And the pages started rustling. <laughs> and they rustled, and they rustled, and they rustled. <laughs> there was no one there who knew where the, I, you know, I grew up in church that thought the only book in the Bible was the book of Acts, you know. They didn't know where it was. So we had a Bible drill. I taught them Old Testament, taught them New Testament, taught them, you know, the, the, that the Old Testament was full of history books and poetry books and major prophets. And, and they loved it. And finally, we got to Acts chapter 2. And I made my point, and they were just shouting, hallelujah, you're ready to go, you know. I said, okay, turn to the book of Daniel. And the pastor stood up in front of the entire congregation and said, we do not allow anybody to read from that book in this congregation. I said, why? He said, you obviously are not a seminary graduate, because if you were, you would know the book of Daniel is a fraud and shouldn't even be in the Bible. So we got into a debate over the book of Daniel. I said, well, Jesus quoted it. Well, I, he said, you know, that's the, he quoted it because it had just been written at the time. that I said, come on. It was including the Septuagint translation. He said, what does that mean? I said, well, that, that translation was made 280 years before Christ. He, well, I don't believe that's when it was made. I said, it was shown to Alexander the Great when he came to Jerusalem. He said, where'd you get that story? I said, from Josephus. He said, ah, Josephus. All he ever wrote was old wives' tales. I said, do you want me to go home? He said, no, you just can't quote out of the book of Daniel. <laughs> so I stood there for a moment. I said, Okay. <laughs> Turn to Genesis 3.15. Let's look at the first Messianic prophecy in the Bible. And everybody started turning. He stood up and he said, we will not allow that verse to be read in this congregation because I know what you're going to do with it. You're going to use it to talk about the virgin birth and we don't believe in the virgin birth here. This went on all evening long. I wish I could say that this was an exception to the rule, but I'm telling you, I've run into this kind of hardcore unbelief over and over and over again. Now, it's easy to throw rocks at liberals. I mean, they're just such easy targets. But there are others who abuse Bible prophecy. In fact, there are conservatives who abuse Bible prophecy. These are the spiritualizers, the spiritualizers who use the Bible against itself. There are both liberal and conservative spiritualizers. They are the ones who say the Bible never means what it says, particularly when it has to do with Bible prophecy. They'll take a passage like the one in Revelation 7 that says that during the Great Tribulation, 144,000 Jews are going to be sealed supernaturally by God, protected by God during that time, and probably will be great evangelists going out all over the world sharing the gospel. And they take that and they say, well, the 144,000 doesn't mean anything at all. That's just a number. And these are not Jews. This is the church. Did you know one time I looked at all of the commentaries on the book of Revelation that I could find? And 85% of the commentaries I could find said those 144,000 Jews was a church. 
Folks, what would God have to do to convince us that He is talking about 144,000 Jews? He says 144,000. Then He numbers them by tribe. He names them by tribe. Would He have to put a neon light in the heavens and focus, you know, just flash it on and off and say, Jews, Jews, Jews? He said 144,000 Jews. I believe He meant what He said. Yet it's amazing. How people take that and spiritualize it and say, oh no, this is the church. It's a symbol for the church. Well, I want to suggest to you that God knows how to communicate. I want to suggest to you that He wants to communicate. And I want to suggest to you that He doesn't play games as He communicates. You do not need a Ph.D. in hermeneutics or a Ph.D. in imagination to understand the Word of God, even to understand Bible prophecy. What you do need is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. So we have the apostates, we've got the uh, spiritualizers, but there is a third group that is guilty of abusing Bible prophecy. And these are the fanatics. The fanatics are often people who truly believe in Bible prophecy, unlike, unlike the editors of The Sun who just use it to sell newspapers. But they usually believe ardently in Bible prophecy. But they are so obsessed with date setting and with endless speculations. They are sensationalizers to the core who play with Bible prophecy instead of using it in a responsible manner. They are the ones who often make me ashamed of being a Bible prophecy teacher because when you say that to people they often think, oh he's one of those guys, you know, looking under every rock for the Antichrist. We are in the midst of an epidemic today of these sensationalists. And, 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 and I think this is no accident. I think the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more of these sensationalists there's going to be. Because Satan is trying to deceive people by taking some really honest people, some really sincere people, and, and they just simply get so deceived into start, start setting dates and naming names and all that sort of thing. And it's like the little boy crying, wolf, wolf, wolf. And they do this over and over. And then when a responsible Bible prophecy teacher comes along and says, I don't know the date, but let me tell you, we're in the season. They say, oh, come on, you're just like the rest. We are in an epidemic. Let me just mention a few to remind you. In this epidemic of date setting, we started in 1988 in this great plague with the man by the name of Edgar Wisnat. Remember, 88 reasons why the Lord's coming back in 1980. He spoke two million copies of this pamphlet. I was knee deep in them. My radio listeners sent me one after I was just going to ignore it. But finally, I decided I've got to deal with this. And so I did. And I pointed out, if you accept all of his assumptions, Jesus came in 1988, but his assumptions are all false. They're not based upon biblical concepts. When Jesus didn't come, guess what Edgar Wisnat did? He put out a new pamphlet, 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1989. These guys never learn. Or take, for example, in October, the, uh, the, the church in Korea, which set the date of October the 28th, 1992. Everybody in the church sold everything they had, gave it to the church. The church used that to publish pamphlets in every language of the world. In fact, I was on in Moscow, walking down the streets of Moscow, when a Korean, an Asian man walked up to me, handed me a pamphlet. I knew enough Russian to be able to figure out what it was. And it was a pamphlet about why Jesus was returning on October the 28th, 1992. Or consider this man, Harold Camping, who owns the largest Christian radio network in the United States. He predicted that the second coming would occur in September of 1994. It didn't happen. Or consider Monty Judah, a, a, a fellow in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, this is a guy who, who uh, formed a ministry in 1995 and suddenly announced to the world that the tribulation had begun in 1993, September of 1993. He picked that because that was when, you remember, Yitzhak Rabin met with Arafat at the White House and signed the peace treaty. He said that was it. That was the beginning. I always got amused by that because let me tell you something. When the tribulation begins, nobody will doubt that the tribulation is starting. Nobody will have to call it. I have pastors call me and say, do you think we're in the tribulation? I said, brother, let me tell you, if we were in the tribulation, you wouldn't have to ask anybody. I mean, it's going to be something horrible. Yet he said it started in 1993 and that the Antichrist would appear in Jerusalem in March of 1997 to stop the sacrifices. I called Monty. I said, Monty, are you aware of the fact that there are no sacrifices in Jerusalem? He said, I know that's a problem. But I think, he said, I, I think that they, they will be started, they'll be started before then, and then they will be stopped. And he said, you know, you're just a scoffer. You're just a scoffer. He said, I'm a prophet of God and you're a scoffer. I mean, this went on and on and on. Finally, he had so many people uh, uh, challenging him, he actually issued a written statement saying, I am so convinced that I am right that if the, uh, if the uh, what I prophesied does not happen, I will demand 
that I be stoned to death. And he even went so far as to say, I will let Dave Reagan throw the first stone. <laughs> I wasn't interested in stoning the man to death. I was interested in the integrity of God's Word and people not making fun of it. But he missed it all and he continued. He didn't get stoned to death. Or consider this pamphlet that a lady sent me in, uh, uh, from Texas. This was a Texas lady down in South Texas. She wrote one called Rapture Alert, and she set the date for the rapture of May the 26th, 1996. Or consider this pamphlet put out by a prophecy teacher in Michigan. The tribulation to begin in 1998, the second coming would occur in 2005. On and on and on it goes. And yes, Harold Camping came back just like Edward Wisnett, published a new book, Time Has an End and has set the new date for the coming of the Lord to be the year 2011. Some people just don't learn. It just keeps going on and on. Meanwhile, the speculation concerning the identity of the Antichrist continues unabated. People are, you know, I could show you article after article on this in which people are saying, well, it's Henry Kissinger. No, it's Bill Clinton. No, it's Jane Fonda. It's Hillary Clinton. It's Rosie O'Donnell. It seems like anybody that somebody doesn't like, that's who it is. Uh, some have even said Ronald Reagan, but he's passed on now, so he obviously is not a good candidate. But it goes on and on and on. And the weirdest I've ever run across is in this book, The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. This book is 450 pages long. And in this book, he does everything he can to try to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Prince Charles is the Antichrist. Now, folks, I've met this guy personally, and I said to him, let me tell you something. One of the biggest wimps that's come down the pike in a long time is Prince Charles. How in the world could you possibly think this man is going to be the Antichrist? He said, that's part of the whole deal. This is his disguise. He said, when the time comes, it's going to be like Clark Kent walking into the phone booth, taking off the clothes, coming out as Superman. He said, all of this is an act. He's really a very strong guy underneath. And one day, he will reveal to the world that he is the Antichrist. Is it any wonder? that people think that Bible prophecy is a playground for fanatics. But I've got good news for you. If it's properly taught, it can be green pastures for disciples. Now, in addition to it being abused, Bible prophecy has been sorely ignored. I mean sorely ignored. Some have ignored it because they say it's just too complex. And I, I love this particular cartoon that shows this fella up on a ladder and he is trying to draw all of these uh, different uh, diagrams and so forth. And these guys down at the bottom trying to figure out what in the world he's doing. The caption reads, the elders try to make sense of Pastor Steve's third point. Well, I've seen this sort of thing going on. People say it's just too complex. Nobody can really understand it. Well, I would agree that Bible prophecy requires what Dennis Pollock, my former associate, used to call that dirty five-letter word, study. It requires study, but anyone who is willing to commit study to it can understand Bible prophecy if they have the Holy Spirit residing within them. Many pastors uh, take a different position, but before I do that, let me show you one other uh, 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 cartoon that I love about this uh, uh, concerning the complexity of Bible prophecy. Here is a Bible prophecy teacher. He's got his end time chart. He's got all kinds of little notes on the end time chart. He's explaining everything in detail, and this poor lady gets up to ask a question, and guess what he says? Says. No questions, please. I find they disrupt the flow of my answers. <laughs> well, I have seen a few of those along the way also, which of course makes it complex for people and they think it's impossible to understand. Now, another reason people have ignored Bible prophecy is because they consider it too otherworldly. This is where many pastors are. I will say to a pastor, why is it you never teach on Bible prophecy? And his answer will nine, nine times out of ten be, because it's all pie in the sky. It has to do with the future, not with the present. He'll say, David, you're a traveling evangelist. You're not a located pastor like I am. You do not understand the problems I have. You don't understand that I've got every sin known to man in my congregation. I have got adultery going on. I've got homosexuality. I've got uh, people involved in gambling uh, who are addicted to gambling. I've got, I've got everything you can imagine going on, and I've got to preach practical, down-to-earth sermons. I do not have time for pie in the sky. And my response to him is, I can understand that, but you don't understand Bible prophecy. Because let me tell you something about Bible prophecy. There are two life-transforming facts that you need to know about Bible prophecy. Number one, 
If you can ever convince a person that Jesus is really coming back to this earth, I mean truly convince it. Not here. That's where most professing Christians believe it. I'm talking about believing it here in your heart. Because you don't really believe anything until it moves to your heart and it begins to have an impact upon the way you think and the way you talk and the way you live. If you can ever convince a person that Jesus really is coming back, and number two, His return is an event that could occur any moment. Their lives will be transformed. You know why? Because, first of all, they'll commit their lives to holiness. And secondly, they commit themselves to evangelism. Let me tell you something, folks. That's about as practical as you can get. How much more practical could you get than, uh, than teaching something that's going to cause people to commit their lives to holiness and commit their lives to evangelism? But that's what Bible prophecy does if it is properly taught. And I've seen it happen in my own life, and I've seen it happen in the life of others. Now, there's another reason Bible prophecy is ignored, and that is preachers often say to me, it's too controversial. I just don't want to get into it because if I do, I know it will cause dissension in the congregation. People will get mad. People will be fighting each other over it, and some people will leave. And there are good cartoons about that one, like this one. I just love this. These two old geezers in the ring, they've got on their boxing gloves. They're looking at each other like they hate each other. And what is the uh, caption? It has to do with eschatology. <laughs> well, I have seen that happen from time to time. But let me tell you something. Bible prophecy can be divisive. It can be divisive if a person comes into a congregation with a chip on his shoulder, determined to prove that everybody else in the world is wrong except him. And I've seen that happen. But if a person comes with the right attitude, not with cockiness, not with a determination to prove everybody Will the Antichrist rise out of Europe and be of Roman descent, or will he be a Muslim? Could he be a Jew? And will he be killed and raised from the dead? Also, could he possibly be alive today? For answers to these questions and others concerning the Antichrist, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end-time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm delighted to have my colleague Nathan Jones with me, and you know what? I'm going to turn the program over to him. It's all yours, Nathan. Oh, wow, whole program. <laughs> well, thank you, Dave. Uh, folks, Dr. Reagan's latest book is this one. It's The Man of Lawlessness, and it's subtitled, the Antichrist in the Tribulation. Now, I'm going to put Dr. Reagan on the hot seat, since I'm given the opportunity, and interview him about this book and ask him his opinion on some very controversial questions. Now, I want to first say, Dave, thank you for this book. I read it in two sittings. It was oh, just okay. easy to understand, easy to read, and, and I loved it. And I want to know, why did you decide to write a book on the Antichrist? Well, that's a good question, because I tell you, Nathan, uh, writing a book about the Antichrist was the last thing I thought I would ever do in my life. I, uh, I just... Uh, I didn't expect to do that. And I guess the reason I did it was because I saw so many things coming out recently uh, that were about the Antichrist that were so confusing uh, and so unbiblical in nature, particularly people trying to name the Antichrist over and over and things of that nature. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe we just need to get a book out there that covers the fundamentals of what the Bible says about the Antichrist rather than a bunch of wild speculations. And so that's one of the reasons that uh, I decided to uh, do this. Another is, of course, the fact that the Antichrist is a very important person in Bible prophecy uh, uh, in general. This is a fellow who's going to take over the world. The first person ever to rule the entire world is going to be the Antichrist. He's going to fulfill the dream that Hitler had and other uh, tyrants of that nature. He, the Bible says he's going to rule every tongue, tribe, and nation. And it says that during the seven years that he's reigning, he is going to be responsible for killing one half of the population of the world and two-thirds of all the Jews. So it's an important topic in Bible prophecy. I love where your heart is uh, in the preface. You say, our focus of attention should be on Jesus Christ and not the Antichrist. And that is, that is so true. We have so many people obsessed with the Antichrist. And you didn't want to feed that fire, right? That's right. A, that's right. Yeah. And over and over you say, we, our focus should be on Jesus Christ and not the Antichrist. Now, I noticed as I read through here that nowhere did you name the Antichrist. Uh, is, 
Did you want to do that, or is there a reason to do that? No, 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 no. Uh, two, I guess two of my greatest pet peeves in the whole field of Bible prophecy is, number one, people who try to set dates for the return of the Lord. Yes. I don't think we can know the date. We can know the season of the Lord's return, but not the date. And secondly, would be those who try to name the Antichrist. Yes. I think the Bible makes it very clear, Nathan, that no one's going to know the Antichrist until he reveals himself. And and uh, I don't think we're going to be around then. I think we're going to be taken out of here before then. But but uh, the people who try to name the Antichrist get into all kinds of wild speculations. And, and in fact, I have a whole chapter in here uh, that is just about naming the Antichrist. Oh, that and, was and it's fun. The, I think it's the funnest chapter. Tell us the craziest one that you <laughs> well, believe. I, I think it's hilarious. Uh, yeah. I started off with, with a very funny example of what people get into. Uh, uh, my former colleague was Dennis Pollack, uh, whom many of our viewers are very familiar with. He was with the ministry for 11 years back during the 90s. And uh, during that time, we had a daily radio program. And uh, so he came to me one time and said, you know, I'm fed up with all these people trying to to guess who the Antichrist is. And he said, I'd just like to, to do a radio program about that. I said, well, that's fine. Uh, Dennis, do it. So he gets on the radio and he starts off in a satirical way by saying, I can prove to you who the Antichrist is. He said, I can prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Antichrist is none other than the purple dinosaur, Barney the purple dinosaur, Barney. who was very popular <laughs> among kids at that I time. Love you. And so I yeah. give it all the calculations in here that show uh -huh. beyond a shadow of a doubt that Barney's name adds up to 666. Six, six, so he must be the Antichrist. The but what is funny is in the middle of all that, some guy tunes in. He didn't hear the in, uh, the opening of the program. He tunes in while while Dennis is, and he thinks Dennis is serious. So he <laughs> writes us this enraged <laughs> letter saying how irresponsible uh, we are that we would be naming uh, Barney the Purple Dinosaur as the Antichrist. But what I do in this chapter is I move from something silly like that to some really serious ones. One of the major candidates is Nero, and I go into detail as to why I don't think there's any possibility that Nero. He's dead. Yeah. Uh, well, but. Uh, the Bible, uh, many people believe the Bible indicates that the Antichrist is going to be resurrected from the dead, so which I don't believe. Okay. Uh, then there's one uh, new book just came out by a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, of all things, naming the Antichrist as Augustus Caesar. And, and then uh, the, the, uh, one of the silliest I read across is The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. That's the name of the book Cohen's in which book, the right? fellow names Prince Charles as the Antichrist. Now, that really floored me. I met this fellow in Colorado. He came up to me and said, have you read my book? And I said, yes. Mm -hmm. He said, what do you think? I said, well, brother, brother, let me tell you something. If Prince Charles is the Antichrist, then all I can say is Satan is in big trouble. And he said, why do you say that? I said, he's such a patsy. I mean, he's such a, he said, oh, well, that's all an act. Okay. Said he, he is acting like he's, you know, weak and, 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 uh, but said, boy, when the time comes, it's going to be like uh, Clark Kent stepping into the phone booth and coming out as Superman. So I discuss his uh, arguments, you know, and why I don't think they hold any uh, water also. So my conclusion is that we should not be involved in war, uh, trying to guess who the Antichrist is. And in fact, I end with a quote from a church father, Arrhenius, written in the year 189 A.D., in which he said, don't spend your time trying to guess who the Antichrist is. It's a waste of time. Right. Church won't be here for you. Well, I hope not. <laughs> I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and my interview of Dr. <laughs> David Reagan concerning his new book about the Antichrist. Now, Dave, do you believe that the Antichrist is alive today? Well, that's a really good question. And uh, many years ago when people would ask me that, I would say, well, not necessarily. But uh, then I've got a whole different view on it now that I express in this view book. And that is, I believe the Antichrist has always been alive in a certain sense. Yeah, how so? In a certain sense. And that is that... Satan knows Bible prophecy, and he knows that a day is coming when he is going to empower and I believe even possess the Antichrist. And so I think the problem is he knows Bible prophecy, but he doesn't know when God is going to trigger it. He doesn't know when God is going to trigger all these end time events. So I think what uh, throughout history he has always had a candidate, always somebody that he is ready to anoint. 
So in that sense, I think the Antichrist has always been alive and is alive today. I think he has a candidate. I don't think the person knows it. I don't think we know who it is, but he has a candidate. And when God makes his move, Satan will make his move. And it says that he is going to empower this guy. I think he's going to possess him just like he possessed Judas. So yes, I would say he's alive today. Okay. So at, say during World War II, Hitler could have eventually been the Antichrist if given the right circumstances That's right. or That's Mao right. or... Yeah, and it, so absolutely. today, do you think the guy knows he's the Antichrist? No, I don't think so. Okay. No. It'll be happening when the events take that's place. Right. Okay. That's right. Well, that's great. Now, one of the neat things, and not because I was in it, <laughs> but uh, you had a prophecy forum where you asked 22 different Bible prophecy experts about different questions. And uh, I let the audience know this was my first time being interviewed by Dr. Reagan on TV. I was pretty nervous. But I, I love the question. I love the different points of view. Can you tell us a little about it? Well, yes. That is really the most unique aspect of this book. And, and I'm hoping to write some future books that might have the same uh, characteristic. Section 2 of this book is entitled A Prophecy Forum. And, of course, what you know is that about two years ago, we went to the pre-trib conference that's held in Dallas every year of, of oh, people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, there's hundreds of people there. And we always get a room and we set uh, these prophecy experts down and we interview them. Uh, we interviewed about uh, uh, 12 at that time. And we ask them five questions about the Antichrist and put together a series of television programs, which people always love those programs. Oh, it's the because, most popular shows on YouTube. You know, they YouTube. get so many different views from people. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have to understand that although uh, the uh, premillennialists agree on the general picture, the picture that uh, the church is going to be taken out before the tribulation, and there's going to be seven years of horrible uh, 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 wrath of God on this earth, and then Jesus Christ will return. They disagree about a lot of the details, and people are not always aware of that. And so uh, I was trying to show that, particularly with this Antichrist thing. I asked each of these fellows five questions. Who are the, some of the people you Well, asked? here's the point. After, not only did we include the 12 that we did in the, in the interviews on television, but I also sent out invitations to 10 others. And so we have a total of 22 Bible prophecy experts. Wow. We have their pictures and their names in here, including Nathan Jones Nathan of Lamb and Lion Ministries. The least known but, of the you know, entire people group. like Mark Hitchcock, who is <laughs> Mark Hitchcock, who is one yeah. of the most prolific writers today on Bible prophecy. Oh, yeah. uh, David Hawking, uh, Dave Hunt, uh, people like uh, Tim LaHaye. Uh, and Chuck Missler, it goes on and on. You included a woman, too. Oh, that that's right. Uh, Carol M uh, Matriciana. Good in to fact, see her I now. wanted Jan Markell, but she wasn't able. She was ill at the time. Yeah. So we get 22 Bible prophecy experts, and we start asking them uh, these questions about uh, the Antichrist. And uh, they had a lot of different viewpoints, a lot of different answers. For example, on the very first one, will the Antichrist be a Jew? And then what I do is I write an essay there that summarizes all the different points that these people make. And then I put a chart at the end that indicates what they believe. So that, for example, we had one, two, three, four, five who said he could possibly be a Jew. We had two who said he will be a Jew. And all the rest said no possibility. Mm -hmm. So you see there is difference of an opinion. And we did this on a number of these uh, questions. Uh, we had five in all that we asked them in each one. I give a summary and then we give specific answers of what they what they did. And I think this is just an absolutely fascinating part of the book. And, and I think probably the answer that surprised me the most was the one that we received uh, uh, from Tim LaHaye. Of course, he answered all five questions. Yes, you changed his view on something. Well, I, not necessarily me, but uh, he, he wrote back and he said uh, it was had to do with the question of whether or not the Antichrist would be killed and resurrected from the dead. And he wrote back and he said, you know, in the Left Behind series, I took the position, he and his fellow writer, that the Antichrist would be murdered and would be resurrected from the dead and this would cause the whole world to turn to him. He told me in his uh, response that he had never written anything that received so much criticism from fellow Bible prophecy experts. Not from the general public, but uh -huh. from the federal. He said, it caused me to go back to the scriptures and to really study them uh, on this particular topic. And he said, as a result of studying it, like I'd never studied it before, he said, I came to the conclusion that I was wrong in the Left Behind series and that the Antichrist really is not going to be killed and resurrected from the dead, but it's going to be a great deception. 
mm-hmm. that uh, it will, he will appear to have been killed and resurrected, but it's going to be a deception. That's he, because Satan doesn't have the power to resurrect well, anybody, right? Well, that's true. And, and uh, some of the fellows do believe that he will be killed and resurrected. Mm-hmm. But Tim LaHaye said no, that he had changed his mind. And uh, I would say that most of them, uh, the vast majority of them on that question believe it's going to be a deception of some kind or another. And really yeah. the person who wrote the most eloquently about this was uh, Philip Goodman. You know it, uh, Philip mm-hmm. Goodman. Mm-hmm. He has a ministry in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a Bible prophecy ministry. And he wrote eloquently about this, Always does. about about the the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That the resurrection is what... Uh, certifies Jesus as the Son of God, as our Messiah, as our Savior. Mm-hmm. And he said, no one is ever going to experience a resurrection like Jesus Christ. Yeah. Even the resurrections that we read about in the Bible are never called resurrections. They're called, uh, 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 the, the person came back from the dead. They never really used them because the Hebrew concept of resurrection is truly the idea that you come back in a glorified body. And the people who died in the Bible and were resurrected, re- resurrected were really resuscitated because they did die again. Jesus is the only one who ever died and came back from the dead. And that's not going to happen to the Antichrist. That's going to be one of the many deceptions that the Antichrist and his false prophet will pull on the world. But again, the the point I was trying to make Mm -hmm. in this whole section is that even though those of us who take a plain sense, literal approach to the interpretation of Bible prophecy, we come out with a general overview that we can agree on. But we disagree about many, many points. Uh, Will the Antichrist headquarters be in New York? Will it be in Rome? Will it be in Babylon? Uh, Things of that nature. Many things that we disagree on. And and, uh, uh, all of them have good biblical arguments. I mean, that's that's to me what I liked is that even though 22 people had their different opinions and some of them I didn't agree with, I got to learn what the other opinions are. So when by and they based them on the Bible. Yeah, they're all biblical. So I could sit there and I could know not just one or two views, but I get five or six arguments for the same subject right there. And I might agree, I might not. But again, like you said, they're they're not primary doctrine that we need to have a disagreement. That's right. And the Bible just always is not real clear about some of these minute points. Points of Bible prophecy mm-hmm. that some people get their Moses all bent out of shape over, but yes. as uh, you know, especially concerning the Antichrist. Right? Well, uh, <laughs> well, you got that right. So that's uh, what that's what I tried to do, and and I think as a result of that, that this particular section of the book is going to be something that people will find very very interesting. I certainly do. Particularly did. because it contains viewpoints by Nathan Jones. Oh, that, that'll be the big draw right there. Nathan Jones, buy the book for that. No, uh, great book. I really loved it. I really did. And that was, the, to me, the most special part of the entire book was getting to read all the different people's views. Thank you. Welcome back, folks, to Christ and Prophecy and my interview of Dr. <laughs> David Reagan concerning his new book, The Man of Lawlessness. Now, Dave, uh, Section 2 we were talking about before the break has 22 Bible prophecy experts answering five questions. Now, we already answered, is the Antichrist alive today? And you said... Could be. There's always been a man in the wings who could be the Antichrist. Right. But if it's all right with you, let's cover the other four questions. Okay. And I'd like to start, will the Antichrist be a Jew? People are always wondering, what is his origins? Will he be a Jew? Well, uh, there's a, a good biblical reason why for many years, in fact, throughout most of history, people have argued that the Antichrist will be a Jew. And that's based on John 5, verse 43, where Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. And you do not receive me. But if another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. I believe he's speaking there of the Antichrist. Church scholars throughout history have believed that. And so they thought, well, if he's saying that someone else who comes will be received by the Jewish people, then he would have to be a Jew in order to be received by the Jewish people. So that's the basis for the argument that people believe that maybe he will be a Jew. What do you think? What do I think? (laughs) Well, uh... I'll answer the same way I answered in the book here. And, and that is, uh, if you go to uh, Revelation chapter 13 and you read about the Antichrist and the false prophet, and it talks about the Antichrist coming out of 
the sea, yes. which in the Bible, for everything in relation to Israel, the sea was a foreign nation, a foreign, a Gentile country. Gentiles. So yeah. if the Antichrist is described as coming out of the sea, that means his origins, his ethnicity is not Jewish, that he would be coming out of most likely Rome. If you go to Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the people who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, which was the Romans, he would then be a Roman. So he would probably not be a Jew. I really doubt that he'd be Jew. But some, some people did argue that he could be a Jew, right? Wasn't yes. one in particular? Well, they did. And, uh, but I, uh, the overwhelming uh, answer to that was uh, that he certainly was not going to be a Jew. And uh, that was the, the opinion of these uh, particular Bible prophecy experts. The majority, right? Yeah, by a, a overwhelming majority that he was not going to be a Jew. Now, I, I think you summed up the arguments beautifully there because, uh, again, uh, the Bible uses the sea as a symbol of the Gentiles. And it says the Antichrist is going to come out of the sea. That's a symbol of him coming out of the Gentile nations. Mm -hmm. and, but the, uh, the other one that I think is the most important one was the other one you named from Daniel, where it says that the Antichrist is going to come from the people who destroyed the temple. And that, of course, was the Romans, and they were Gentiles. So I don't think there's any possibility he's going to be a Jew. Uh, I think throughout church history, uh, he has always been identified as a Jew, not only because of these biblical reasons, but also because of uh, vehement, vehement anti-Semitism anti yeah. and uh, the church trying to make the most uh, terrible character in all of history a Jew. So ethnicity-wise, then, we're pretty much in agreement he's a Gentile. Now, I what about so. his religious background? This is a lot of contention. Will he be a Muslim? <laughs> that's a very lot of contention to get a lot of emails well, about people wanting that. Is a lot really of angry people about that topic. Well, uh, this is something that I don't think ever yeah. occurred to anybody until recently. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, you know, people tend to interpret Bible prophecy out of the newspaper. So whatever is popular in the newspaper, well, that's it. Well, today the Muslims are on the rise. The Muslims are very aggressive around the world. So uh, we have people now saying, well, I think the Antichrist is really going to be a Muslim. We have a fellow by the name of Joel Richardson has written a, a book about this, and he is the primary advocate of this viewpoint that he will be a Muslim. And, uh, you know, the first time I heard about that, uh, my immediate reaction was that that's just crazy because uh, the Bible says point blank that the Antichrist will walk into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, take his seat on the throne there and declare himself to be God. What Muslim no, <laughs> would never, ever never. declare himself to be God? I mean, uh, this is uh, anybody would do that would be immediately killed by the Muslims. I mean, they, they would not have anything to do with it. Uh, but th their theory is, no, that, that the, the Muslims are going to increase in power and uh, the Antichrist will, will really be a Muslim leader. He will be the Mahdi. They, you know, in, in Muslim theology, uh, they believe that there's going to be this Mahdi who will come, who will be their Messiah. And he says, no, that's going to be the Antichrist. And that he will uh, unite all of the Muslims of the world behind him and uh, they will be the most powerful force and uh, they will be the ones who will come against the Jews and all that in the end times. Yeah, uh, there, there are a lot of problems with that. Not only the problem of, of a Muslim ever declaring himself to be God, but uh, you know as well as I do, there's two wars that are indicated, the Psalm 83 war and the, Psalm, uh, the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. In my opinion, that's going to pretty well wipe out uh, the Muslims in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of Muslims are in other parts of the world, but in the Middle East, there's not going to be much left to lead there. Don't, wouldn't you agree? I don't see how that Islam could be a major player in the tribulation. Once Israel subdues its neighbors in Psalm 83, and then once God supernaturally defeats Iran and Turkey and Russia and Libya and all these major players in the Middle East, how could Islam possibly stand? How could a Muslim have faith in Allah anymore when the entire infrastructure of Islam is destroyed? And then the Antichrist, when he comes in to fill out that vacuum, more than likely will annihilate the rest of the Muslims in, right. in India and Bangladesh and other places. In, like in fact, uh, the indication of the scriptures is that the Psalm 83 war and the Psalm uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 war were most likely going to take place before the tribulation begins Which or early end. in the tribulation. And there's just not going to be any Muslim power left in the Middle East when that's uh, uh, done with. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it. Well, one problem is that the person who talks the most about the Mahdi is uh, the leader of Iran today. And that's a Shiite nation. The Shiites are at most 20% of the Muslims, really probably closer to 10%. 90% of the Muslims in the world are Sunnis. Mm -hmm. and, and I cannot believe that some Shiite Mahdi is going, because they argue that when he appears, the first thing he's going to do is declare that the Shiite version is the correct version. Of course. And then of all course. the Sunnis yeah. are suddenly going to say, oh, great, and, and, and unite oh, behind yeah. this guy. Furthermore, that violates the uh, covenant that God gave to Ishmael. In that covenant, God said, you will always be a people 
who will not be able to get along with anyone, including yourselves. Uh, the Sunnis and Shiites are never going to, they hate each other with a passion. They're never going to unite behind some Mahdi or whatever. It's mm-hmm. just the whole theory goes against everything we have here. And, and of course, their number one argument now has become, well, Daniel 9 says that the Antichrist is going to rise out of the people who destroyed uh, the temple. And they argued that most of the Roman soldiers were people from the Middle oh, East. And, all, and, yeah. and so they said, you know, they're, 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 those are people from the Middle East. And so they're going to be kind of rise out of the Middle East. This, my argument there is I don't care what they were. I don't care if they were... If they were Australian Aborigines, it was the Romans who decided to destroy Rome. It was the Romans who gave the order to destroy Rome. It was Roman generals with Roman troops. I don't know how the Bible could be any clearer. It's not going to be the Muslims. Very good. I agree. Totally 100%. Now, you touched a little bit about another question you asked the panel, and that was, will the Antichrist be killed and resurrected? Do you want to add anything more to that? Well, only to say that, again, those who believe that the Antichrist will be killed and resurrected from the dead have mm-hmm. good biblical basis. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is not something that they just pulled out of the wild blue sky. I mean, think if he died and got resurrected, how, what an influence that would be on the people oh, well, of the sure. tribulation. They'd say, well, he must be a god. Well, the, the biblical basis is in Romans chapter 13, where he talks about seeing that beast rise up, uh, I mean, Revelation 13, where he sees the beast rising up out of the sea. And he speaks about the fact that he has ten, uh, uh, ten horns and seven heads, and he has ten diadems. And it goes on to say that one of those uh, heads appears as if it had been slain, as if there was a fatal wound and he had been resurrected or brought back from the dead. Well, first of all, those heads represent, I believe, kingdoms, not uh, the kingdoms of the world, the, the great empires of the world and the secession of those empires. And the fact that one of those that died, every one of them died, but one of them, the Roman Empire, Daniel said, would come back in the end times. So I think this is a reference to the Roman Empire uh, and the Antichrist coming out of the Roman Empire, a resurrected Roman Empire, and not really a reference Union? to him. Uh, okay. Now, we, we're told over in Zechariah he will suffer a wound. Uh, and it says here that the wound will appear as though it's fatal, but it doesn't say 